insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights in Entertainment. <clears throat> this is episode 76. Disney Magic with CBD. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my talented and tolerant co-host, Michelle Whalen. Hi, everyone. How are you doing today, sweetie? I'm good. How are you? Very good. You look very nice today, by the way. Thanks. You sort of dressed it up a little bit for the show today. Yeah. Well, you know, it's Sunday. I don't, I don't know. I, I, I don't really get dressed up. Actually, it's funny. I actually get a little bit more dressed up during the week. When nobody sees me, yeah. um, you know, I, I don't do the whole pajama thing. Um, I actually do put on dresses um, just because it's comfortable, yeah. you know, during during the week. So, yeah, I figured, what the heck? Well, there look, we go. Look nice for today. You do look very nice today. Well, thank you. So today we have in our Disney detective, we have some information on the artificial intelligence bag check scanners going into Hollywood Studios. Mm-hmm. Then we'll talk about a grandmother who had a very unfortunate event uh, at D- Disney World uh, due to her CBD. Then Tom Hanks is selling his soul to Disney now. I thought he already did. Uh, I, I think he rented it. <laughs> oh, okay. You know, he didn't get next, locked into the the next phase, the proverbial six movie deal type right, thing that right, Disney right. likes to do. And then in our Tales from the Galaxy's Edge. We have a fan video that shows why all of the titles are wrong. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. Mm-hmm. It is. In our entertainment news, we will talk about Mulan coming to Disney Plus, which was kind of contrary to what everyone had thought uh, mm-hmm. up until now. Right. And in a related story, one particularly disgruntled theater owner uh, who's not happy about that news. Exactly. <laughs> uh, then we will finish up with our insightful picks of the week, of which. Uh, mine this week is not a documentary. And mine is. Go, Go figure. figure. Wow. So, <laughs> uh, busy show today. I yeah. think we're going to have a good one. You ready to go? Sure, let's do it. All right, let's go. Go for Disney Detective. So we had talked about this a couple months ago that they were starting to unveil some new bag check scanners. They actually were doing it at Hollywood. Um, no, I'm sorry. At Disney Springs was the initial uh, location that they were using them where basically you just had to walk through. Um, you know, the the security cast members basically just had an iPad that would be able to to see on the information um you know see what you had on you as you walk through it was supposed to also be able to take your temperature as well so much more uh much le- much less hands on than the current uh system because right now um without these scanners the security uh team is actually going through your bags you do go through um a metal detector, basically, but if they still find, you know, metal on you, then they, you know, would normally wand you down. So this seems to be uh, a much faster method, a much safer method. So Disney actually had rolled out these at Hollywood Studios during the week. Uh, the scanners actually had already been at Animal Kingdom back on July 11th when they had opened and had now also rolled out at um, Epcot's International Gateway entrance, which is the side entrance uh, towards the back of the park, um, and also now at Hollywood Studios. So the person that wrote the article said that they were talking to multiple security managers at Hollywood Studios, um, and they had actually asked for people not to take pictures of 
uh, the scanner. So the setup uh, was actually um, from a different park that they were were showing um, in in the article. Um, so not only does it cut down the wait time, but it gives them you know, much more, um, streamline, uh, to, to be able to check the bags. Um, these were actually the scanners that were involved in a situation, um, a couple of weeks ago where a guest was attempting to bring guns into Epcot. <laughs> Woo! So that was fun. So the scanners actually found, um, you know, found the weapons, uh, so they were able to, uh, stop the guest from obviously bringing them in. Um, so it's, uh, a touchless system. Um, it, it talks about that it can do 60 people per minute, uh, 3,600 people per hour. So that, you know, definitely helps with the flow of, you know, people coming into the park. Um, and, you know, this way it, it seems to be much more reliable and safer experience. And also due to COVID-19, this way the, you know, cast members can actually check bags kind of from afar. They don't need to be right up on top of the guest as, you know, they're going through these checkpoints. So it'll be interesting to, you know, hear if anybody, you know, has any, you know, issues with them, but definitely a way to kind of speed the process, you know, up because, you know, we've waited in lines for, for a while. Um, you know, they did have an area where if you didn't have any bags, you could kind of go right through. Now it kind of sounds like doesn't matter. You all go through at the same time and, you know, your party can, you know, stay together the entire time. So, so I know Disney has, has tried to combat the <clears throat> slowdowns of bag checks for quite some time. Mm -hmm. now. Uh, in fact, they went so far as to putting the pre checks in. Um, at some of the resorts. Right. So you could check that before you get on transportation mm -hmm. to get in. Right. How are they handling? Are they just doing away with all that and everyone's going through these scanners now? Or they I'm not sure. I still? think, you know, they haven't really talked about it yet. Um, you know, the pre checks, that was really only done for Magic Kingdom. Okay. Um, and that was done for the resorts that were on the monorail. There weren't any other, uh, resort areas that I know of that were even doing that. Um, so that when you, you know, if you were on the monorail and you were at, um, you know, one of the resorts on the monorail, before you even got on the monorail, you went through bag check. And then as soon as you got off, where normally you would funnel down through the rest of the, the guests, now there was an area where you basically just went right to the turnstiles. Um, so now that they have these new systems set up, I haven't heard that you know, about them being at the actual resort. So I'm guessing at the resorts, you're still going through the regular system, you know, that they so have. I, I assume they're, they're staging these ahead of the ticket booths as mm -hmm. you walk in like mm -hmm. they were with the bag checks right. too. Right. Now, are they doing away with bag checks? From what I entirely? heard from, from some people, they were saying that, you know, security wasn't even touching anybody's bag like that just for safety reasons for them they don't want to touch your stuff now um so i think this is kind of helping because they don't want you know their their cast having to really come in contact with you if they don't have to so now this is giving them an opportunity to still maintain everything safer you know for everybody else now they haven't talked about it going into uh, the Magic Kingdom yet. So I wonder if Magic Kingdom, if they're still doing physical bag checks or, or what they're, you know, even doing. So Interesting. Yeah. Interesting how they're employing technology to, to solve some of the more common problems that came mm -hmm. out of COVID. Yeah. So speaking of bag checks, <laughs> why don't you tell us about the grandmother who had an unfortunate experience? Yeah, this, this was actually a story that I hadn't heard about, but you did. You had mentioned to 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 me about the story. And then lo and behold, when I went looking, it, it popped up. So a grandmother who was arrested outside of Walt Disney World is suing the happiest place on earth. Uh, happiest place on earth. Um, so it's Hester... Burkhalter, who is 69, was arrested back in April of 2019 after Disney security had found a bottle of CBD oil while searching her purse at a security checkpoint. So according to uh, 
uh, TMZ, civil rights attorney Ben Crump has filed a lawsuit against Disney, the Orlando Police Department, and the Orange County Sheriff's Department on her behalf. He happens to also be the uh, attorney who is representing the family of George Floyd um, with everything that's going on with that. Uh, so TMZ actually had uh, reports, uh, had learned that um, she had been arrested and detained by cops at Walt Disney World in April uh, and had claimed that she was only using the CBD oil for medical purposes and that it was actually for her arthritis and that she had a doctor's note. Well, you know, they had questioned her about it. They ended up bringing her down to the station, had her strip searched through all of this, all while her family, you know, was still in, in the park and, and everything. Um, so she is in the suit. She is alleging uh, assault and battery, false arrest, imprisonment, uh, defamation and emotional distress, among other things, and is requesting more than $18 million in damages, plus additional damages for her husband and family members who were all vacationing with her. So, yeah, interesting. Now, supposedly, so, um, you know, I think the the charges were dropped in May of last year yeah. after everything had happened, but she's still going along. Um, well, you know. and as well, she should. I mm -hmm. mean, I use CBD. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a derivative of the hemp plant. Right. Same family as marijuana. Mm-hmm. The CBD oil is easily obtainable mm -hmm. and it's legal yep. on the federal level. Mm -hmm. There's nothing illegal about it. Right. Contains no THC. Mm -hmm. Now, the in the article that I had read, the there, I guess there was an on-site sheriff, mm -hmm. county sheriff, and they did a chemical analysis on-site once and it came back with zero CB, uh, THC content. Right. Why he did another one because he did a second one and mm -hmm. that one came back positive. Now, THC is the psychotropic ingredient that's in marijuana, right. which is a controlled substance under the federal under federal law. So CBD oil is commonly sold. I mean, mm -hmm. you can buy it in nutrition stores. You can buy it off the web. You can buy it just about anywhere. Right. We can get it at our Amish farmer's market. There's exactly. a booth that sells it. So Exactly. So there's nothing illegal about CBD. And right. the fact that... The label on the bottle even says that mm -hmm. there is zero percent THC on it. Right. Um, the fact that they went to these ridiculously extreme mm -hmm. measures. Um, I mean, I, I can understand questioning it. Right. If you if you're not educated on mm -hmm. the subject, but by the time this woman was arrested and taken to the police station. Somebody should have known that what they were doing was wrong at this point. Right. Like a Google search would have <laughs> answered any questions within right. two seconds that so, everything was fine. The fact that this woman was, you know, an elderly woman, mm -hmm. grandmother from Disney is is forced to a strip search, full body cavity strip search yeah, at the police. That's just Disney, you know. Whatever this is going to cause, Disney needs to pay this because mm -hmm. Disney was in the wrong totally yeah. with this. And so is the sheriff's department. Mm -hmm. I mean, if your sheriff's department is going to try to enforce laws that are on the books, then they have to be aware of these things. Mm -hmm. Yep. So this is this is a big embarrassment for mm -hmm. Disney. Yep. So uh, what else did we have? Was that we have one more? We have Tom Hanks selling his soul, right? <laughs> Yes. So Tom Hanks has obviously given many memorable performances, um, you know, from Splash and Big to the, uh, Philadelphia, The Post, obviously many uh, titles under the Disney franchise, uh, such as Toy Story, uh, Saving Mr. Banks, where he actually played Walt Disney himself. And now it would appear that he is going to be in another Disney project. Um, and it's another reimagining of a classic. So Tom Hanks is set to play Geppetto in Disney's live action remake of Pinocchio, which will be directed by one of the actor's biggest collaborators, Robert Zemeckis. So according to Deadline, negotiations are actually still in the early stages 
but Hanks has reportedly reached out to Zemeckis to let him know that he is interested in the role. So Hanks was actually originally attached to this role back in 2018 when Paul King was actually set to direct it. Um, but he had actually left the project and then Hanks actually lost interest in it. Um, but then once he heard that uh, Zemeckis was going to be involved again, he got in touch with him and was like, yep, I'm willing to do it. Um, and this will actually be um, the fourth time that they've, uh, I'm sorry, they've worked together four times already. Um, they worked on Forrest Gump, Castaway, and The Polar Express. Um, and he got, you know, Best Oscar nominations for uh, Forrest Gump. So obviously they work well together. Um, so the film is actually still in the screenwriting stage. Um, they haven't announced a date or, you know, anything else for it. Um, but it's obviously the remake of the 1940 version, uh, animated version that Disney did. Um, Disney obviously has, you know, done very well with their live adaptations of, you know, classics. So, this will probably be, you know, another one that they're hoping uh, does well. And uh, so it'll be interesting to to see what they do with it. Um, I'm struggling to see Tom Hanks as Geppetto, though. I don't know. I think, you know, the older he gets, he, he's 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 doing OK with it. I don't know. I, I guess. I mean, I guess my I have a very classic idea of what, you know, Geppetto looks like and sounds like. And, mm. you know, I, I, we'll see. We'll see. I mean, he's he's an incredibly talented actor mm -hmm. can yeah. can play just about any role. Yeah. Um. I mean, when you go from uh, playing, you know, in Bosom Bosom buddies. buddies to uh, to, <laughs> to being Disney himself, yeah, you know, that's that's a heck of a career there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we'll see. We'll yeah. see. It should be interesting. I mean, I've we've liked all of the live. Yeah, actions all the the different ones where done. we've kind of even been like. Eh, this will work you know they they do yeah. seem to to work you yeah. know they have that niche where there's something familiar about it but yet all of them have had something different about them to make it their own movie well and you know after uh, uh what was the tv show the disney tv show that took all the stories not ever after Once Upon a Time. Oh, Once Upon a Time. You know, after Once Upon a Time and seeing the live action mm -hmm. adaptation of yeah, these characters, true. it's it's totally believable. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's easy to see that. Mm -hmm. Cool. So that was all we had for our Disney detective. Yeah. We'll take a quick break and we'll return with Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. <laughs> For seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Go for something, something Star Wars. <laughs> oh, that was funny. So there is a Star Wars fan video that proves why every film has its wrong title. Okay. So you following so far? 
I'm fine. We're not going to watch the video, though. No, we're not going to. You don't need to watch the video. So a new Star Wars fan film makes the argument for why every Star Wars film has its wrong title. So it was actually a video that was posted on TikTok from Fake Disney Facts and takes a look at the Star Wars episodes one through nine and all their titles and then takes things a step further by showing how you can actually rearrange the Star Wars saga titles to fit much better with what actually happened in the movies so it's actually kind of funny when when you read through um through this so here here's how it you know here it goes so episode one is phantom menace but it's all about the discovery of anakin skywalker as the chosen one and his first major victory in battle therefore it really is the rise of skywalker okay Episode 2, Attack of the Clones, is all about the mystery of a clone army's creation and Darth Sidious making major moves to undermine the Republic, Jedi Order, and the path of Anakin. In many ways, it's the true moment of the Sith's revenging plot, so Revenge of the Sith. Episode 3, the big climatic twist of Revenge of the Sith is Order 66 and the assassination of the Jedi, and it's the only real Attack of the Clones mo- movement in the entire Star Wars uh, Skywalker galaxy. So that's re- so it should really be Attack of the Clones. So then episode four, which is A New Hope, we get to see Luke Skywalker become the first real hope for the Jedi after decades of the Order being in hiding. Obi-Wan teaching Luke in uh, the now forgotten Jedi ways should really be called Return of the Jedi. Episode five is uh, The Empire Strikes Back. So in a long chase sequence, but Luke's part of the story sees him learning the deeper meaning and ways of the Force from Yoda. In terms of the story development, it's the moment when the Force awakens for both Luke and the viewers. Uh, Episode 6, Return of the Jedi, Yoda dies, Anakin sacrifices himself uh, in his redemption. uh, redemptive moment defeating Emperor Palpatine and as the movie ends Luke realized that he is the last Jedi since Leia has not been trained yet okay uh, then uh, so where are we so that was six so seven uh, after Luke and the re- uh, Rebellion Alliance end the threat of Palpatine, the Empire survives and envelops in the dreaded First Order. Uh, so that should really be the Empire Strikes Back. Then we have the whole Ryan Johnson, Last Jedi, blah, 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 which, you know, we know sucked. It's about the older figures like Luke and Leia pushing the younger generation, Rey and Poe, to keep the spark of the rebellion alive. And then with Luke's sacrifice, he is, uh, um, he gives his sacrifice to the resistance. That is now giving everybody a new hope. And then finally, the opening crawl of Rise of Skywalker actually starts with the often mocked The Dead Speak uh, by bringing back Palpatine as the thought, you know, that he was dead, but now he's been still lurking. So that is really the Phantom Menace. Okay. So it kind of... I, I think I think they're all very well reasoned. Yeah, it, it kind of, when you think about it, you're like... Yeah, okay. Yeah. Sure. I still think some of the titles just out and out suck Don't to work. begin with. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I get that too. But if you had to go with what was already existing and kind of put it in that order, it kind of, you're like, yeah, I could, I could okay. see that. Like somebody had some time on their hands I'll, during quarantine. I'll tell you what, so I'll agree that they work as long as we can erase The Last Jedi, you know. <laughs> episode eight from the annals of existence if we can do that you can name the movies anything you can you name want. them whatever you want whatever you want <laughs> so, hey sometimes it's a stretch so what can i say you know um i'm not sure this this helps the franchise at this point no, but it certainly no. puts things into perspective something to do during quarantine like i said one, one more way to confuse fans who have not been there from the beginning right exactly just, just to make it harder mm-hmm 
Okay. Well, I guess that works. Uh, <laughs> until they come out with more, and then we have to come up with right. Then we have to another rename title everything. Shuffle, you know. So all over again. Let's take a quick break, and we'll come back with our entertainment news. Okay. Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com or on the web at insightsintothings.com. Tell us about Mulan. So on Tuesday, Disney surprised movie fans with the announcement after multiple delays for the theatrical release due to the ongoing uh, coronavirus pandemic that fans will actually get to see Mulan as a premier access release through Disney Plus streaming service. So the uh, release will allow subscribers to watch the film from the comfort of their home beginning December 4th. Now, it's not going to be like how Hamilton or Artemis Fowl or any of the other movies that they've released. With this, you actually do have to pay uh, a premium on top of uh, your subscription to the service. Um, so it'll be a one-time fee of $29.99, um, and it'll actually not just be a one-time rental – uh, the movie will be attached to your subscription as long as you have your subscription. Um, so it's not just, a, you know, a one and done, watch the movie or have it for just a couple of days. You will have it for the length of your actual subscription to Disney+. Plus. Um, so it's, you know, getting its video on demand release, which is something kind of a surprise, um, you know, because Disney has made numerous attempts to try and bring it to the theater but with everything going on they've decided um you know that it was time to to do it on a video you know on demand um to help offset some of the the loss you know lost revenue obviously that they're facing uh during everything um you know the uh bob chepik the uh disney ceo noted that disney you know is still planning to you know bring it to the screen once you know it's available you know to do that once theaters start opening um but that their plan right now is you know this is kind of the only film they're planning on doing this with because they obviously have a lot more movies that are supposed to be released and as of right now they are still holding out um to release those you know in the theaters um so it's set to be released on uh september 4th uh both disney plus and then if there are theaters that are open by then it will be you know released to the theaters you know as well so i think it makes me feel good you know, I'm going to pretend just for a moment that somebody at Disney watches this podcast because this is exactly <laughs> what we had suggested a couple of episodes Absolutely. ago. Absolutely. We sure did. For Rolan. You know, you spent all that money to produce this movie mm -hmm. and you can only sit on it for so long right. before you have to get a return on that investment. Right. Right. Um, and it makes sense. I love the the twist that they add to this, mm -hmm. where it's not just a rental. Right. You're basically buying the rights to that while you have a subscription. Right. And that was the other thing, too, because as news came out, first it started off with 20, you know, $30 to, to just watch it one time. It was like, all right, well, that's not so bad. You figure, you know, if we went to the movies to go see it, we'd be paying probably close to $45. So, all right, not a bad deal for us. And then they came back and said, no, it's going to be 
part of your library for as long as you have And this is the first streaming service, service to offer that. Everyone mm-hmm. else, the max you can have it for is maybe a week or two weeks, and then it's gone. Right, right. Even even services where you're paying $20 to get mm-hmm. a first-run movie. Yeah. The fact that I can pay 30 bucks and this is attached to my subscription mm-hmm. now, that's one more incentive to keep my subscription going. Absolutely, absolutely. So this is a brilliant move on mm-hmm. Disney's part there, not only to – Keep the fans happy mm-hmm. by getting this these movies out there so they can see them under the current conditions. Mm-hmm. But to incent the the viewer to mm-hmm. keep their subscription mm-hmm. by like because it, it doesn't do them any good to do right. away with it. Right. So it, it just it this was this shocks me that Disney thought this one out this well. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Usually Disney is not this forthcoming when it comes to. You're, True. You're, 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 you're they're viewers. usually, but yeah, they're usually the you know the last to to do you know anything uh, like that. So it'll be interesting to see you know how well it actually does. And you know, again, even though they're talking about it, you know, being the the only movie that they want to do it for, maybe they'll see you know once they see the returns come back on this and yeah. they see how much money they're going to make off of this maybe it'll, it'll make sense for them to do it for other movies yeah so we'll see we'll see what else happens you know so it's uh september 4th and i'm sure we will you know this was a movie we were looking forward to to seeing our daughter was actually supposed to go on a class trip uh, and i'll, I'll be honest to with see you it, this so. is probably you know, given the nature of the movie and what we're expecting to see from mm-hmm. this, we haven't seen anything of it yet. Right. But this is probably one that should it even come out in the theater next year, say, mm-hmm. and it's safe to go back to the theaters, I could totally see us going to the theater to mm-hmm. see us because of the experience of seeing this type of movie in the theater. Right. Yeah. So. So very cool. Yeah. Um, someone's not happy about that news. Tell us about that. No, nope, sure seems not. So, a French movie theater owner went viral this week after a video of him destroying a Mulan pop up lobby destroy surfaced on Twitter. So, earlier this week, Disney had announced that, you know, Mulan was going to be coming to Disney Plus with the rental upcharge uh, in September. And just not in the US, it was also going to, you know, <coughs> Excuse me. It was going to be wherever Disney Plus uh, was available. So the video actually shows the theater owner bashing the cardboard Mulan display with a bat, um, flattening it to the ground and at the end standing, you know, very proudly, um, you know, in the ruins. Uh, The reaction of the operator following Disney's uh, decision, obviously, uh, you know, kind of. We could understand where where he was coming from. Um, you know, he is uh, the owner of an independent theater in the south of France, and he told uh, Deadline that he was surprised by the video's response um, and that... <laughs> Yeah, here, here you see him just ripping it to shreds. He's he, he was pretty mad. He, you know. <laughs> um, he said that he's grown frustrated by Hollywood ever since, uh, you know, French or movies, you know, haven't been able to to be shown in, in the theaters. Um, now, even though in France theaters actually started opening back up in June, they just haven't really had anything to show because nothing has been released. Um, You know, he had said it's a huge effort to stay open right now for most of us. And we are assuming there would be some ambitious movie releases in the coming weeks, but by losing Mulan, we lost the possibility of offering our audiences a long awaited film that would have helped us pass these hard few weeks. It is also a bad message to send to the public who have been expecting a theatrical release. So, he wasn't very happy, but, you know, there's, you know, other movies that are supposed to be, you know, released. Uh, Tenant, which was one that was supposed to be one of the first ones to be released. And, you know, that's been pushed back. That is supposed to actually be opening in France later this month. You know, so he basically said, you know, thanking Warner Brothers for still keeping that, you know, available for them to, to you know, to show in their theater. So... Well, and and the man does make a valid point. Mm-hmm. You know, his business is suffering tremendously, and all all theater businesses mm-hmm. are suffering because of COVID nineteen, right? Um, and 
you know, we talked about this a few, few weeks ago when you had a couple of movie theaters who were colluding to not show certain studios right. um, products because mm-hmm. they decided to release them online, streaming, right. which that decision itself was monumentally stupid because it's not going to help you at mm-hmm. all. Yeah. Uh, you know, those, especially if, if you, <laughs> and this is what blows my mind is, they're up. They're, these people are upset because the movie theaters are releasing through an alternative uh, outlet, so they're going to ban themselves right. from being a release outlet to protest them using an alternate outlet, which in turn guarantees that they're not going to have revenue from that, even when the the theaters, mm-hmm. the studios start to move back into the theaters. Mm-hmm. Um, so. I understand the frustrations. I understand mm-hmm. the 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 fear that these institutions have at losing the revenue to online services, but I think they need to recognize the fact that this is probably not going to be a permanent thing. This Hopefully. is experimental yeah. right. right now. They're going to see if this works, and even if it does, moving forward. It's incumbent upon the theaters at that point in time to ensure Mm -hmm. the safety of their users. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, businesses are opening all over the place uh, under proper conditions. Mm -hmm. And theaters are no different. Theaters are going to have to cut back on the number of people that they seat. You're going to have to space it out. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to take measures. It's not going to be easy. Right. It's not going to be cost effective. Mm -hmm. But if you plan on staying in business you're going to need to take certain steps Mm -hmm. you know getting upset because disney's trying to find an alternative way to release their products it's it's not going to solve anything for Mm -hmm. you right so anyway he was definitely one angry man (laughs) that's for sure just a little bit uh so that was all we had for entertainment news Mm -hmm. uh we'll come back real quick with our insightful picks of the week. Go for your insightful pick. So my insightful pick uh, is a documentary that was on Netflix um, entitled David Foster Off the Record. Um, So, you know, it was funny as we were talking about it, you're like, who's David Foster? And it's one of those things where you might not know his name, but you definitely know his music in some way, shape, or form. So it's impossible to avoid, um, you know, any of his music because he's been around for close to five decades. So, um, you know, he started off in the 70s. He was actually part of a little Canadian pop R&B uh, band. Uh, but then he helped uh, the Tubes with She's a Beauty. He co-wrote and produced that then he uh earth wind and fire after the love has gone uh he co-wrote that in the 80s um he did a whole slew of songs with chicago and actually ushered in their power ballad uh error and actually was also part of the breakup between uh pita satera and the rest of the group which was kind of interesting to to hear about in this um then he you know had a whole bunch of um uh saint elmo's fire uh the theme from from that was written by him then the 90s came along and you had tony braxton's biggest hit unbreak my heart whitney houston's i will always love you celine dion's because you loved me um he actually um helped save ben vereen's life by hitting him with a car uh, which is actually a crazy story in itself. Um, you know, he was out driving home late and there was a man that came in the middle of the street and he hit him, had no idea who it was. And, and as it turned out, um, Ben Vereen had actually, he was having a stroke. And that's why he was like roaming the street. And if he hadn't hit him with his car, and gotten him to the hospital and and gotten him help, he actually would have died of the stroke. So totally crazy, crazy story. Um, you know, in this, you see how um, he helped to 
bring Josh Groban to uh, to the forefront. Uh, also, Michael Buble, you know, was another one. So he's had his hands in just so many, you know, uh, major hits, you know, throughout the the various decades and and all these powerful songs and and um, you know, just brought out the best of everybody. Like Celine Dion, she was already a star by the time he you know, started collaborating with her and like pushed her to the point where like she was cursing him out. And then of course he got like the best performance out of her like ever. Um, so, you know, it's funny. He, he talks about, you know, what a, you know, what a jerk he is really, you know, and that he's surprised he's gotten as far as he has in the music business, but he just knows the right thing. And, you know, and he's never been afraid to tell people off or tell them how he, they think. And, you know, in the end, he's usually always right. Um, so really kind of fascinating, uh, you know, and hearing all these stories from, you know, Barbara Streisand even, and, you know, all these different celebrities who he's helped bring, you know, to the forefront. Um, and he just has that magical music gift that, you know, not a lot of people, you know, have, or, you know, people that just wish they had, you know, when one tenth of, you know, what he has. So really, really interesting. And it's one of those things, like, I always knew a little bit about him, but this was kind of interesting to see, you know, more of his, his backstory. Cool. Good pick. Thank you. So my pick this week as we teased at the beginning of the show, is not a documentary. Oh, my gosh! Uh, my pick is actually uh, kind of a throwback to my childhood, and it is Transformers War for Cybertron trilogy, uh, recently released on Netflix. Uh, the, uh, chapter one of the trilogy has been released, uh, and uh, the intro just says as the Autobots and Decepticons ravage their planet in a brutal civil war two iconic leaders emerge in the Transformers universe's origin, origin story uh, now if you're a child of the 80s like I was and you watched the Transformers then um, you sort of caught the tail end of this war for Cybertron concept as the Autobots came to Earth uh, for refuge. Uh, this is reflected in the more recent uh, Michael Bay movies as mm -hmm. well. Um, but what this new series does is it sort of delves into the politics and the details okay. behind, you know, what caused the war, what were some of the philosophical differences, who were all the characters and the players in there. And it gives you some of the backstory of um, what that was before we saw it in the first chapter. The next chapter is, is um, going to deal with the time on Earth, so I'm curious to see how that goes. Uh, and then the last one sort of melds together another popular uh, Transformers franchise of the uh, prehistoric ones where it was Beast Wars. Uh, so they're going to have some kind of time travel twist where they wind up going back in time and have to deal with uh, Earth in its primordial days, I suppose you could say. I finished watching the first uh, chapters. There's only a, a handful of episodes in the mm -hmm. first chapter. And the animation, it's interesting because it's the Transformers themselves are all the classic Transformers. Okay. Uh, they aren't all the redesigned ones from the Michael Bay movies. Um and it's, it's funny seeing the animations because they're more physics based, I think, in this animated series. Okay. Where they're big and bulky and, you know, like when you used to play with your Transformers, you couldn't make them do the things that they could do on the animated series because they just physically couldn't do them. And you see some of that come through uh, in this new animated series here, which is interesting. The hardest part that I think I've had about the entire series is that they didn't bring Peter Cullen back in to do the voice of Optimus Prime. Mm. So all the other characters are very 
uh, original in their voices. They like Starscream is bang on. Megatron's you know really good, even though they didn't get the original uh, voice actors to do all the roles. But you know if you don't land the voice of Optimus Prime that was so characteristic and and so iconic, then it's really hard to to kind of buy the character, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's not like he, he doesn't have the same voice. It, he doesn't even speak in the same cadence either. So it makes for some mm. awkward dialogue. Um, but outside of that, the storyline seems pretty good. Uh, they seem very dedicated to the original concept. And uh, I was I was kind of impressed with it. I'll, I'll certainly watch the rest of the chapters as they come out. That is Transformers War for Cybertron on Netflix. Okay. So that was all we had for today. Mm -hmm. Uh, Before we go, uh, I would invite you to check out our long form articles on Medium at medium.com slash insights into things. We are also available for subscription for podcasts. If you are going to subscribe, our audio versions are listed under insights into entertainment and our video versions are listed under insights into things. We're available on Apple Podcasts. Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, et cetera, et cetera. We are now also listed on Amazon <gasps> uh, Podcasts, and you can even convince your uh, Amazon Echo devices to subscribe to us on their insights into things. Wow, that's cool. Branching out here. Mm-hmm. We would also invite you to provide us with feedback on the stories that we're talking about. Is there anything you'd like us to cover Uh, Is there anything you'd like us to not cover anymore? (laughs) Um, We're certainly open to it. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can find us on Twitter at insights underscore things. You can get us on Twitch. We stream six days a week at twitch.tv slash insights into things. You can also find us on Facebook at facebook.com backslash insights into things podcast. Our audio versions are available at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com. Our videos are on YouTube as well at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Or you can get links conveniently to all those things on our website at www.insightsintothings.com. And that's it. That is it. Another one in the books. Have a good week, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you.